Hello and good morning everyone. Today we are going to talk about something we are very passionate about. As soon as I find the clicker, it is there. As uh, my dear friend Versace here already said, you can use the Osiris for many things. Uh, one of the things that we use it today is called MASI and this is Micro Aberration Scatter Index and he showed you the mathematical formula which is it looks very daunting and scary, but it's very simple at the end. But let's go why we need it. This is Mr. Zernike. He got the Nobel Prize in 1953 for describing the optical aberrations. But that was not his only Nobel Prize. He got one for inventing very special microscopy things like confocal microscopy and whatnot. This is the standard pyramid tree that we see in almost every ophthalmic device from Back in the early days of topographers like the Zeiss Atlas, the Pathfinder, every single device shows this. But most people have no real idea what they see. So we're just going to go and quickly talk about the few things we see. On top, we have the zero aberration. It's called uh, piston. Then we have uh, tilt and, uh, well, basically tilt. And then we have astigmatism, defocus, and oblique astigmatism. Those are the low order aberrations you can fix with every single optical device. Glasses, contacts, the rest of them, you need something else. You need either corneal refractive surgery, hard lenses, or brain power. Because every single eye on the planet has many aberrations. Don't think that a perfect eye is the one without aberrations. The eye and the brain can compensate for a lot of it. But what happens when what you're trying to describe is not here? When this complex polynomial expression is not enough? What do you do then? Well, then you talk to Versace and you say, hey Versace, come up with something so we can describe it and measure it. So then he did it. But let me show you why we asked for it. This patient is 2020. This is a functional simulation of his vision after character refractive surgery. No one would say this is a good image, but if you're only measuring visual acuity and he's 2020, you would not understand why is this patient complaining to you? What's the problem? You're 2020. But he's so unhappy. She said, He's saying, my image is soft, the lines are not clear, and yet he's 2020, maybe even 2018. But he's unhappy, his contrast sensitivity, it's very low. On the other hand, this patient, uh, the image is a little bit blurry because of the projector, has super sharp vision. He's also 2020, like the one before, but they're not the same. They're not equally happy. So how do you differentiate between these two images? Let's ask Zernike. Well, that's a very disappointing turn of events because the wavefront from both of these eyes looks about the same. There's no real difference. Clinically, completely insignificant. There's virtually no low orders in both eyes and virtually no high orders in both eyes. So obviously what we were looking for was not there. But if you look at the retroillumination images, you see that these are distinctly two different images. On the left is the eye with very blurry and uh, I want to say low quality of vision situation. On the right is the eye with super happy, great vision, great contrast. So how do you quantify this? Before Versace, we were doing it, um, well, Bad, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, good. But how do you improve if you only have good or bad? How do you say one is better than the other when you have a million photos which look all virtually the same? Well, you invent MAZI. That is the difference in MAZI. When you calculate MAZI for these two images, one is 63, one is 12. Okay, small number, good, big number, bad, easy. But what does it mean and how do we come up to it? And what does MAZI mean in our daily life. And you already saw this. This is the formula how he came up with Mazi. You take out all the Zernike and what's left is, well, Mazi. So what are the real enemies of character refractive surgery? It's, I call it the 20-somethings. First of all, 
when you do binocular reading after character refractive surgery, you're hiding any tiny little errors. Second, when you measure and they're 20-20 and you stop, maybe they're 2018, maybe they're 2016, how do you know that what you did yesterday, you could maybe achieve something better? Don't measure to 2020. Measure up to whatever you can get. 20 happy, that is the biggest enemy of advancement because as soon as the patient's happy, you stop. Okay, how do you know you're not getting the, how do you know you could not get better? Shine fluke. I already spoke about why shine fluke is not great, but it's not really great. ARKs, ARKs tell us nothing about post-op refraction after character refractive surgeries and the opinion of eye doctors saying, hey, what I'm doing is good enough. My patients are happy. I don't need to change. I don't need to compare. I don't need to objectivize what I'm doing. So what we did is we tried to find out which of the objective or subjective factors we can measure comes up and describes this quality of vision that my patients were having in that rough situation. So we looked at Logmar. Doesn't really help. Logmar they are 2020 20 or 0 0.0 or minus 0 0.01, and yet they can be unhappy. So it's not a good predictor. HOA, we already know the higher order aberrations are not the key. And then we came up with contrast sensitivity. Contrast sensitivity was the only test which could differentiate between a patient who is happy and unhappy. Now, who here has really done any sine wave testing with contrast sensitivity? Yeah two, three, four, maybe six, seven hands. How much do you hate doing contrast grating sine wave tests? Because I hate it. I hate it. You know why? Because it takes me 20 minutes per eye to do this. And also, it tells my patient that something is wrong because he's asking, why don't I see those lines? Am I supposed to see that? Is this normal? Why is it not good? And they just paid you a lot of money for, for surgery. So you doing this makes them really anxious. So, and it also depends when they're reading, am I cl looking correctly on what they said? So, you know, this is prone to examiner error and prone to patient error and patient fatigue. And after 20 minutes, they want it over, you want it over. So we st set out to see if we can skip the contrast testing and use something objective to simulate contrast sensitivity. So what we did is we took MAZI as a starting point we took 84 eyes where we measured MAZI, contrast sensitivity at 3, 6, 12, and 18 degrees, total uh, ocular higher orders, spherical equivalency of that patient, mesopic pupil size because we were testing contrast in mesopic conditions at about 5 millimeter pupils because we don't want photopic conditions. Those are easy for everyone. And then we looked at their unaided visual acuity in Logmar. What happened is this is how this chart looked. So we had patient demographics, visual acuity, and the aberration and the prescription of each patient. So that was the decision tree for creating the protocol. And in summary statistics, you will find that the average age was 28.14, mesopic pupil 506, CPD was 188, 174, 104, and 107. But what's important is MAZI. MAZI was all the way from 13 to 62. And Logmar on average was 0 0.009, so all of them were better than 2020, with extremely low spherical equivalency and ocular wavefront issues. So what we found, we created a correlation matrix, and what you can see here in this area is MAZI and the CPD score. The only real factor that we recognized as a single important factor for predicting contrast sensitivity was MAZI. All the other factors were helpful, but MAZI was able to account for up to 46% of the score of the contrast sensitivity of this patient. So we clustered the patients into three groups. Cluster zero, these are the patients with, moderate, with low MAZI scores and pretty good contrast sensitivity. Cluster one is patients with medium MAZI numbers and slightly worse contrast sensitivity. And cluster two, patients with a high MAZI number and very low contrast sensitivity. So what happened here is if you look at this, on top you see mesopic pupil 4.8, 5.3, 5.3. That's not a big difference. This is clinically 
insignificant difference in pupil size. Let's look at MAZI. MAZI 27, 48, 53. Fine, that's a big difference. Logmar minus 0, 14, minus 0, 0, 08, and 0, 52. So Logmar, slight difference, but not too much. And then you look at HOA, 0, 05, 0, 078, and 0, 06. So the group with the worst vision actually has lower total aberrations than the group with better vision. So HOA was not a big predictor. And then you see the spherical equivalency in the group 0.29 plus 0.19 plus 0.18 plus. Those are all clinically insignificant. All are very low. And then number of cases, 30, 24, 30. So what happens when you plot this into graphs? The cluster zero people with super high contrast sensitivity, you can see them there. Very nice. Cluster one, this is acceptable vision. And cluster two, very low vision. This is for three degrees, six degrees, 12 degrees, and 18. Why is 18 important? 18 is the number where you define those tiny little details. That's the difference between a C and an O or a G at the 2020 line. The one who has high contrast sensitivity is going to be able to tell those little things. Or, or when doing Lando rings, those are the frequencies where you notice it. Free is a very low frequency. It's more, more like the 2200 line. Okay? I know it sounds complicated. It's not. Now, if you look at the distribution of spherical equivalency, they're all about the same. HOA, virtually the same. There is a little bit of a difference in logmar, but this is expected because if you have a highly uh, irregular surface in your cornea, of course your logmar is going to suffer. But if you look at MASI by cluster, it's very clear that MASI was the biggest predictor of bad vision. People in good vision group, low MASI numbers. People in Okay, vision group, medium Masi numbers, and people in very bad vision, high Masi numbers. Now, we tried some lasso regressions, and for the average CPD, when you take all the four values and you average them out, you create a weighted score, and you look at Masi, Masi was responsible for 36% of the score, and if you look at Logmar, Logmar was only responsible for 26% of the score on an average. CPD. But what happens if you ask the software to define it for the low frequency, the free CPD? MAZI 27%, LOGMAR 25%, age at the exam 15%, spherical equivalency and HOA below 10% and everything else pretty much unimportant. But most of the patients are not complaining about the low number, the free degrees uh, of the contrast sensitivity. They, they complain about the high number. What happens when you look at 18? Well, MAZI is then responsible for 47% of the score. So we came up with one thing that you can measure objectively within a second. How, how long does it take to measure Osiris? Four, four five seconds? Yes. Yeah. No, no, I do free scans on each eye. Yeah so, yeah, so between four and five seconds, and you get a score. And this score correlates amazingly with their quality of vision. So we then created a multivariant regression and we looked at all the factors and we even created a nonlinear random forest tree thing, which sounds very smart, but it's just like a machine learning algorithm where we feed the data and we got, when we were feeding it all the available data, up to 94 to 96% predictability of contrast sensitivity when using MAZI ocular wavefront information, HOA, and spherical equivalency and mesopic pupil size. So effectively, using the machine learning model we built using MAZI, which is the core component, we are skipping a test which takes 20 minutes to do. So why and what do we use MAZI for? To estimate quality of vision and estimate uh, the, the contrast sensitivity of a patient. We can track their quality of vision over time. You do MAZI test day one, day seven, day 30, day 90, and you track how quickly they recover based on what medication regimen you're giving them, or what your laser power was, or what the settings were, or what your manipulation technique was. And then you now have a simple, elegant way to do this. We can understand highly complex things with just one single number. But what about this? American statement that time is money. Well, if CPD tests take about 20 minutes per eye and all the other tests 
take four minutes per eye. It takes us 24 minutes per eye to do all the tests, which is 24,000 minutes for a thousand eye uh, turnover a year. If you can save those 20 minutes, <laughs> because you're not doing CPD, you can skip it because you can estimate it with MAZI, you save an average of 14 days a year. <laughs> it's a huge number. And trust me, when you're doing a thousand lenticule cases a year, saving 14 man hour days is huge. And in summary, it provides a quantitative, easy to measure light scatter amount. It's not only meant for character refractive surgery. You can track quality of vision after IOLs. You can track quality of vision after corneal transplants. You can track and simulate quality of vision affected by PCO. It doesn't matter what causes the light scatter. For us, the primary goal was to use it for estimating quality of vision after character refractive lens exchange. No, no lens, lenticule extraction, I'm sorry. I hate that name. Clex is the stupidest of all the names they could have chosen. Lalex was bad, but this is worse. In general, it helped us achieve better results and LASIK-like contrast sensitivities because we now had an objective way to test and measure and track. Yeah, that's it. Thank you.